Hello, my name is Gordon Doig, and today I'm going to talk to you about the management of the refeeding syndrome in critically ill patients in the context of the results of a large-scale multicenter randomized control trial. The complete results of this trial can be found on the study website evidencebased.net. Now in this talk, I'd like to give you a brief understanding of refeeding syndrome, some context for the clinical trial that we conducted, focus on some key elements of study design, present the main results, and then summarize. So refeeding syndrome was first recognized in the 1940s, and it usually onsets with the commencement of rapid oral feeding of severely malnourished patients, and it results in diarrhea, heart failure, coma, and has an overall 35% case fatality rate. It's attributable to a severe electrolyte imbalance as a result of a rapid influx of glucose and a release of insulin. As a syndrome, patients present with a constellation of clinical signs. However, hypophosphatemia is accepted to be the hallmark clinical sign of refeeding syndrome. The recommended treatment for refeeding syndrome involves electrolyte replacement, thiamine supplementation, and slow gradual achievement of caloric requirements. So to understand why we conducted the clinical trial that I'm going to talk about later, I'm going to take you back to a second clinical trial that we published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2013. It was a large-scale clinical trial of 32 hospitals throughout Australia and New Zealand. And our understanding of refeeding syndrome emerged from some pre-work that we conducted to set the tone for undertaking this major clinical trial. Fiona Simpson, my co-investigator in this study, and myself, visited 35 hospitals throughout Australia and New Zealand before we started the early PN trial because we wanted to understand current practice with regards to parental nutrition. Uh, we wanted to know what type of patients hospitals used PN in, the composition of PN that they used, and their dosing practices. To understand these sites better, Fiona Simpson asked a scripted series of questions about nutritional practices, and then I followed up with a scripted series of questions about other aspects of practice that included microbiology, the diagnosis of major infections, and uh, the availability of research resources in general. At the first hospitals, first two hospitals we visited, Fiona Simpson asked one of her scripted questions. She asked, how often do you see patients with refeeding syndrome? And the intensive care specialists who we interviewed at these two different hospitals both responded, never. After we got back from the second hospital, we had a discussion. We decided that never was an awfully long time, and perhaps we wanted to investigate this further. So we changed our scripted questions. Fiona kept asking her question, how often do you encounter refeeding syndrome in your ICU? But when I was halfway through my questions on microbiology, I asked the question, do you ever see phosphate drop early during ICU stay after the patient has been admitted long enough to start feeding? We visited an additional 33 hospitals, and seven of these hospitals re responded never to Fiona Simpson's question about how often do you see refeeding syndrome? Of the seven hospitals that reported never encountering refeeding syndrome, when I asked my question, 100% of them reported seeing a phosphate drop. And a phosphate drop is a hallmark clinical sign of refeeding syndrome. Fiona also asked additional questions about refeeding syndrome. She asked, when managing refeeding syndrome, do you monitor and replace electrolytes? Which is one of the key expert-based recommendations for caring for patients with refeeding syndrome, and 100% of our intensive care specialists responded yes. And she also asked a second question, when managing refeeding syndrome, do you reduce caloric intake? This is again an expert-based recommendation for the management of patients with refeeding syndrome. Only half of our hospitals reported that they also reduced caloric intake at the same time that they replaced electrolytes. We reported these results at an American thoracic meeting in 2009. And these findings provided equipoise to conduct a large-scale clinical trial 
to investigate whether benefits, whether patients with refeeding syndrome benefit from caloric reduction at the same time that electrolytes are being replaced. We estimated to see a meaningful difference in our primary outcome of survival time after ICU discharge, also known as ICU free, free days, we would need a 336 patient clinical trial. We have subsequently conducted this clinical trial at 13 hospitals throughout Australia and New Zealand, and we published the results in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine at the end of 2015, and I'm going to focus on the results from now on. Our clinical trial was very simple. We focused on critically ill patients managed in an ICU who had started enteronutrition or parenteral nutrition over the past 72 hours. Within this 72 hour period, if these patients had a serum phosphate drop to below 0.65 millimoles per liter, and this drop was greater than 0.16 millimoles, we considered them further for eligibility. The reason we needed this drop to be greater than 0.16 is that there are analytic and diurnal variations in phosphates. So greater than 0.16 is likely a, a clinically meaningful drop to a level below 0.65. If these two criteria were met, <clears throat> we then checked the patients to make sure that they didn't have any other clinical conditions that might explain the phosphate drop. So anyone who had another condition that could explain the phosphate drop was excluded from enrollment. The study intervention was very simple. Patients were randomized to pragmatic standard care, which meant that the intensivists kept doing what they were already doing, or caloric management. And our caloric management protocol was very simple. Caloric intake, energy intake from enteral or parenteral nutrition was reduced to 20 kcals per hour for at least two days. At the end of this two day period, if the patient's phosphates were stable and the phosphates didn't need replacing, then the patient slowly returned to their normal intake again, following a protocol. To ensure all differences in patient outcomes were attributable to the study intervention, which was reducing caloric intake, we implemented the same phosphate replacement protocol in both arms of the trial. And we also recommend that all enrolled patients received 100 milligrams of thiamine prior to phosphate replacement. This is our phosphate replacement protocol. It, it was published in 2004 in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons. We would call it a progressive phosphate replacement protocol and that the doses that it provides are very reasonable and the dose provided to the patient is based on their weight and the level that their phosphates drop to. So a moderately light patient with only a small phosphate drop would receive 10 millimoles of phosphate IV, whereas a larger patient with a severe phosphate drop could receive up to 60 millimoles phosphate. So this is weight and serum phosphate based dosing. And it was implemented in all patients in the clinical trial. The study was conducted from 2010 to 2014 in 13 participating hospitals throughout Australia and New Zealand. 339 patients were enrolled and randomized. On average, the patients were 60 years old, 40% were female. The mean Apache 2 score, which represents severity of illness, was 18. And 96% of enrolled patients had at least two key signs associated with refeeding syndrome. This is hypophosphatemia plus hyperkalemia, hyperglycemia, respiratory failure, or the patients required diuretics for the management of fluid imbalance. Looking at baseline balance, there were no differences in age or sex or Apache 2 score or the percent of patients who were ventilated who were randomized to both arms of the trial. There was also no difference in BMI between the two arms, but this is very important to look at and notice here. The mean BMI of patients enrolled into the study was 28. So clearly, these patients on visual inspection don't appear to be severely malnourished, but they are metabolically stressed. This is the second page of our baseline balance table. 
and on it we can look at risk factors that are related to hypophosphatemia and refeeding syndrome. At the time of enrollment, the patients were receiving a reasonable amount of calories per hour. 69 kcals per hour is the equivalent, equivalent to around 1,600 kcals per day. For ICU patients, this is very close to target intake. Over the previous 24 hours, the patients had received 1,100, uh, approximately 1,180 kcals each. Notice that our current intake is about 1,600 kcals. So clearly over time, these patients are increasing their intake. They haven't reached goal and they're not stable at goal. These patients were enrolled in the clinical trial approximately a day and a half after starting feeding in the ICU, but they had been in their participating ICUs for approximately two and a half days. This means they spent a day in their ICU unfed. Perhaps even more telling, they spent four days in hospital getting progressively sicker before they were admitted to the ICU. And we know that ward patients, when they're getting sick, they don't have good appetites. So these characteristics here suggest that this patient population is metabolically stressed. They all had at least a day of very low intake, if not three to four days of low intake, if they weren't eating well on the ward. But the uh, two study groups, the most important thing to focus on here is the two study groups were well balanced after randomization. Let's look at process measures. A process measure is a measure of how well the trial was conducted. And remember, our primary intervention is reducing caloric intake. At admission to the study, the average caloric intake was around 1,100 kcals. In the red group here, the standard care patients, you can see that the intake slowly increases over time, especially the first two days of inclusion in the study. In the blue group, you can see that their caloric in intake is significantly reduced. And in fact, although the study intervention only lasted two days, the return to normal intake was gradual over time with an additional three-day protocol, and we achieved significant differences in caloric intake between these two groups on each of the first five study days. Remember, we implemented a phosphate replacement protocol in both arms of the study. And the second slide demonstrates that there were no significant differences between the doses of phosphate received in our study. So any outcomes can only be attributable to reducing caloric intake. And these are very meaningful uh, phos phosphate replacement doses. Uh, the typical bag of, of phosphate available in an ICU contains 10 millimoles. Many centers and many patients receive a 10 millimole dose uh, observation, and then uh, more, more replacement if required. Here we can see that the Taylor protocol, which was weight and serum phosphate based, resulted in an average dose of around uh, 25 millimoles. With a difference in caloric intake and no difference in the dose of phosphate provided, this graph shows the patient's serum phosphate levels. And we can see here for the first two study days, the patients who received caloric restriction, despite receiving the same dose of phosphates, have significantly higher serum phosphate levels. So we achieved a difference in patient serum phosphate levels only by reducing caloric intake. Interestingly, Patients who received caloric restriction also had significantly lower blood glucose levels, resulting in significantly fewer patients with clinical hyperglycemia, leading to fewer patients requiring insulin doses. So caloric restriction led to significantly less hyperglycemia and significantly better serum phosphate control. Now, it's very well known that hyperglycemia predisposes to infections, especially in critically ill patients. It's less well known that hypophosphatemia actually compromises white cell function. Patients with hypophosphatemia have impaired chemotactic, phagocytic, and bactericidal ability. And this is from a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine that looks at white cell function in ICU patients who have hypophosphatemia. 
So both of these changes that we achieved could conceivably result in a difference in infectious complications. So it's very important to look at infectious complications rate. We knew this was an important outcome for this study before we started. We used the most robust and repeatable definition of infectious complications in this patient population that we could afford to use in this study. And we found a trend towards a significant reduction in bloodstream infections in patients who are managed with caloric restriction, a significant reduction in airway or lung infections, and a significantly reduction in pooled any major infections. So what does this translate into with regards to our primary outcome? Our primary outcome is a composite outcome that can be that is termed ICU free days that is effectively days alive after discharge from ICU. And this is based on a composite measure. It includes a calculation of overall survival time, a vital status at the end of the follow-up period, time spent in ICU is subtracted from overall survival time, and patients who do not uh, are not discharged alive from the intensive care unit are discounted in this process too. So let's look at each of the individual measures of this composite outcome. Overall su survival time in the blue group, we can see that we have significantly longer overall su survival time compared to the standard care patients. Uh, there's approximately five extra days of overall survival in the patients who had caloric restriction. If we look at the number of survivors at day 60 follow-up, which was the end of our counting of ICU free days, this period right here, there were significantly more survivors in patients who are randomized to caloric restriction. However, when we look at time spent in the ICU, there was no significant difference between groups and whether or not patients were alive when they were discharged from the ICU there was no significant difference between the groups. So because two of our measures did not differ significantly, whilst two of our measures of our composite outcome did differ significantly, when we combine this into our a priori specified primary outcome, survival time after ICU discharge, there was no significant difference between groups. But we have to put this into context. Overall survival time was significantly increased more patients were alive at time of discharge from hospital, more patients were alive at day 60 follow-up, and more patients were alive at day 90 follow-up who were randomized to receive caloric restriction. So in summary, in addition, caloric, protocolized caloric restriction significantly reduced hyperglycemia, improved serum phosphate control, and reduced major ICU infections. So in our publication in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine, we conclude that many healthcare professionals, patients and families might now judge caloric restriction during the treatment of refeeding syndrome in critically adults preferable to continued normal intake. Thank you very much for your time. If you want more information about this clinical trial, please visit our study website. You can also find information, uh, my contact information on the study website. And if you have any additional questions, please lodge them on YouTube as comments, or please contact me directly. Thank you very much for your time.